Good morning. Today is an exciting day in America as we inaugurate the 46th President of the United States. As always, inaugural ceremonies are a cornerstone of American democracy. It's the day when the voice of the people is enacted and the elected US president, whether returning or new, takes the oath of office. This morning, you'll be hearing from Worcester's own Congressman Jim McGovern, who is reporting to us from his office in Washington, DC. You'll be learning about the history of a peaceful transition and power from Dr. Tony Delara, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Worcester State University. And finally, you'll be hearing students' messages of hope for the next four years. I hope you'll enjoy our presentation. And throughout the presentation, I urge you to engage in an active discussion in the chat box below. If you're new to the area or haven't yet had the chance to meet or get to know Worcester's city, state, and national politicians, I'm pleased to let you know that our city's leaders are some of the most caring and passionate leaders bar none. Congressman Jim McGovern truly leads the pack. He cares about hunger and homelessness, K-12 and higher education, DACA and the Dreamers, and he supports social justice and equity for all. Three years ago, he became the chairman of the House Rules Committee, known to be the most powerful committee in either the House or the Senate. As chairman, McGovern has the ability to influence the introduction and consideration of nearly every single piece of legislation that comes to the floor for a vote. Although he plays an important role in our federal government, he always finds time for his regional constituents. As such, it's not at all surprising that he wanted to take time out of his incredibly busy schedule today to share this message with you. If you haven't had the pleasure of meeting him yet, I am pleased to introduce you to our Congressman, Jim McGovern. Good morning, everybody, and happy Inauguration Day. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you, and, and thank you to the Higher Education Consortium of Central Massachusetts for hosting this important event. The events of January 6, 2021 have shaken and scared many of us. I was actually in the House chamber when these domestic terrorists, traitors I call them, broke into the Capitol building. Speaker Pelosi motioned to me uh, to take over the responsibility of presiding over the House as we were upholding our constitutional responsibility to count the Electoral College votes. I think she thought she was coming right back because she actually left her phone up there. What neither of us knew at the time was that she was about to be whisked away by her security detail to a safe location because a violent mob of homegrown fascists had breached the Capitol building and were headed towards the House floor. You know, people asked me uh, if I was scared, and the answer was actually no. Uh, I was not scared, not because I'm a particularly courageous person, but because I, I, was, I was not watching TV, um, and I, I, I wasn't aware of what was happening outside the chamber. I, I thought it was just a few uh, protesters that uh, got away from security. I could never have imagined that this enormous mob could have gained access to the Capitol building. I instructed my colleagues on, uh, on, on uh, how to put on a gas mask, which was below their seats. Uh, and then I was told to um, guide them to the uh, exit so they could evacuate the House chamber. And I was one of the last members of Congress to walk off the House floor. And I'll never forget, as I looked to my left and I saw furniture piled up against the doors of the speaker's lobby, and there were glass doors there. There were moments from being breached by the terrorists. I, I saw hate and I saw evil uh, as I looked at, the, at this mob banging against these glass doors, cracking the glass, ultimately breaking the glass. Seeing the United States Capitol, our citadel of freedom and democracy being desecrated made me so mad. Seeing the Confederate flag, a symbol of hate and white supremacy, walk through the halls of this building made me sick to my stomach. Since the insurrection, I've, I've spent some time reflecting about the importance of the peaceful transfer of power. After all, let's not sugarcoat things here. This mob was incited by a president who refused to accept the results of an election he lost and an election he lost in a big way. And I'm reminded of just how fragile and how precious this democracy is. When we think of the most important dates in American history, we usually think of things like July 4th, 1776, the day our Declaration of Independence was signed, or March 7th, 
1965, Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama, when John Lewis crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge in a march to expand the definition of our democracy so that we the people includes all the people, not just those who look, think, or act a certain way. But there's another important day that I'd like you to think about, March 4th, 1801. After an incumbent American president lost re-election for the first time ever, that was the day that power passed peacefully for the first time in our history from one political party to another. The election had been bitter and nasty. Both sides said that a victory by the other would ruin the nation forever. The candidates, once friends, vilified each other in the press and on the campaign trail. There was a general fear that the country could fracture. But in what has been called the Revolution of 1800, John Adams conceded, formally handing power to his political rival, Thomas Jefferson. You know, we take this for granted now. Uh, we assume that the winner will assume office and the loser will concede, even in the most partisan of times. But as a history major in college, I can tell you that in most places where democracy has been tried, it has failed, too often at the hands of a tyrant or dictator who refuses to step aside after losing the trust of the people. You know, one of the most important ideas in human rights is called the rule of law. The idea that society is governed not by politicians or individual rulers, but by the laws we all follow. The ritual of the inauguration of one president voluntarily ceding power to another signals that we believe in the rule of law and that we live in a country in which the will of the people governs, not the ideas of a tyrant or dictator. This is why today is so important. And that is why I ask you uh, not to get discouraged or disheartened by what you saw on January 6th, but instead to get involved. History re reminds us that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. We don't have the luxury of sitting back and expecting others to protect our hard-won uh, democracy. We need you to get involved, to speak out and to, to, to get into trouble, good trouble, as my friend John Lewis used to say. We need your voice and we need your vision. Uh, it's important for our country now more than ever. So thank you all very much and please stay safe. Thank you, Congressman McGovern. Next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Tony Dallara, who serves as Assistant Professor of Political Science at Worcester State University, focusing on American politics and public policy. He also serves as faculty fellow to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the U.S. Senate. His teaching and research interests include healthcare, environmental policy, American political development, city politics, political parties, elections, Congress, and the presidency. His published works examine the U.S. healthcare system and the development of the prescription drug regulatory state. Dr. Dallara has frequently served as a political analyst for various media outlets. He graduated from Trinity College and then Brown University, where he earned a Ph.D. in political science. Prior to arriving at Worcester State, Dr. Dallara served over 12 years in state and local politics in Connecticut. He's a strong proponent of civic engagement and community engagement. He encourages his students to get involved in public service, not only as a responsibility of citizenship, but also as an educational experience which enriches the lessons that are learned inside the classroom. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Tony Dallara. Hi, I'm Tony Dallara. I'm a political science professor at Worcester State University. When a young person starts college, one of the first events they experience is the convocation ceremony. Each school might do it a little bit differently, but almost every school has one or something similar. It's an occasion filled with decorations and processions and speeches. But on its face, there might seem to be a little practical need for a convocation ceremony. It doesn't provide students with the schedules. It doesn't help them move into their dorms or their apartments or where to find a parking space. It doesn't distribute students textbooks and school supplies. It doesn't give them any hints about what food might be most edible at the dining hall. Regardless of convocation, when a student starts college, he or she could just show up on the first day of class, complete all the requirements henceforth, and after four years or so, receive their degree. 
Similarly, when a student finishes college and is about to graduate and receive a hard-earned diploma, the final institutional event they're likely to experience is the commencement ceremony. Again, it's an event filled with decorations and regalia and processions and speeches, songs, pomp and circumstance, and sometimes even a prayer. In one simple sense, the purpose of commencement is merely to confer graduation status onto students and to distribute their diplomas. But doing so hardly requires a full day ceremony to accomplish such a simple task. And in fact, often a student's actual diploma won't be received until several days or weeks later in the mail. A student not taking part in any of the above would still be able to start and complete college and receive a diploma at the end of it all, right? Well, perhaps. But without convocation and commencement, something profoundly significant is lost. What is lost in that arrangement is context. What is lost is a recognition of these events being inflection points in one's life. Beginnings and endings and beginnings again. And the ceremony of convocation and commencement provide both the symbolism and the actual instruction about what these moments mean and why they're significant and why the journey has been taken and what that journey is all about. Words to live by and imagery to ingrain in memory forever. A portrait that captures the fact that you are part of something that has been in place long before you arrived and will endure long after you have moved on. Presidential inaugurations are a lot like this. For a newly elected president to take office, the Constitution merely requires that the individual recite the brief oath of office. That in and of itself is an unceremonial undertaking. There is nothing in the Constitution about Inauguration Day ceremonies or festivities. But many of these things that we associate with presidential inaugurations go all the way back to George Washington. So much of the American presidency was left vague in the U.S. Constitution, and it was up to Washington himself to fill in the blanks. One of the many customs and traditions that were established by Washington and carried on ever since was the ceremonial inauguration of our president. It's an act which celebrated the arrival of a new head of state. For George Washington, it was a day filled with ceremonial artillery firing and church bells ringing. It included a walk through large crowds of people en route to a balcony where the oath of office would be administered before Congress and those assembled. For nearly all presidents that would follow, Inauguration Day would feature similar, though thoroughly progressive and elaborate spectacles. A key feature at the heart of this day is the symbolism of a peaceful transition of power following an election. It's an occasion to affirm or reaffirm our shared principles as a united people before political rivals and allies and the public at large. It's an occasion to demonstrate that the presidency is not just about any one individual or that the republic itself transcends politics or political parties or personal rivalries. Throughout the nation's history, presidential inaugural addresses have reiterated these core ideals. In 1801, Thomas Jefferson, who was coming off of one of the most bitter presidential campaigns in our history, assumes office in what is the first transition of the presidency from one political party to another. It was a peaceful transition. He uses his inaugural as an opportunity to remind us that despite the political dif differences or divisions that we had, we are one united people. That we have called by different names, brethren of the same principles. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. In 1961, following another close and bitter election, John F. Kennedy begins his presidential inaugural address by imploring us to observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom. That is what this occasion represents. That is what this occasion is about. But it is also a day for the president to share his or her vision for the country. 
Coming in the middle of the Civil War in 1865, Lincoln's second inaugural address seeks a just path to ending the war and restoring national unity, calling for malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see that right. In the wake of the Great Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's first inaugural address of, eight, of, of 1932 attempts to reassure a desperate nation by reminding us that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. And in his first inaugural address in 1981, in the middle of a harsh recession and facing a public that was frustrated with what was perceived as government dysfunction, Ronald Reagan declared that government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. This simple phrase would turn into a powerful mantra for Republican politicians from that day forward. Perhaps it's not surprising that so many of the most memorable political quotations in our nation's history were uttered by presidents on their inauguration day. It's a day of reflection and anticipation, a day to contemplate where we are as a nation, where we've been, and where we are going, of what needs to be done and how to do it. But most importantly, it's a day that offers us an opportunity to consider our system of government and who we are as a people, that regardless of the results of an election, we have shown time and time again for over 200 years that the will of the people is respected, that power can be peacefully transferred from one political rival to another, regardless of their differences. This is something that has happened far too seldom in human history. Let us hope this proud tradition in America will continue now and always. HECMA, the Higher Education Consortium of Central Massachusetts, is a nonprofit organization serving 11 member institutions in our region. One of HECMA's goals is to encourage and enable students to take fuller advantage of opportunities available on other campuses, explore opportunities to engage actively in the community, and opportunities to utilize the rich cultural resources of our region. Today, as we start a new chapter in our U.S. history, we're asking student leaders from our member institutions to share their hopes for the future of our country. Their messages of hope have inspired me, and I hope they will now inspire you. Hi, my name is Jackie Smith-Wilkes, and I'm a graduate of the nursing program at Becker College. In light of the inauguration, I wanted to share my hopes for the next four years. 2020 was a difficult year for all of us, but there is still hope for the future. I would like to see a country that unifies and works together towards a better future. Especially now, during a global pandemic, we need to look out for each other. I hope that with the new administration, we can bring an end to this pandemic, which can help us go back to living our lives the way we enjoy. I currently work in the hospital directly with COVID patients and seeing them struggle is heartbreaking. As a society, we need to follow the social distancing guidelines and rules that are set in place because they are there for our safety. I would like to see a country that follows these ordinances instead of rebelling against them. I hope that the new administration can bring peace to a country that feels so divided. I would like to see the violence stop and for everyone to be treated with equality and respect. Even though our spirits may have diminished over the last year, there is always the hope for a better future. I wish for everyone to stay safe, healthy, and to have a great 2021. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ronald Pena. I am a senior at the College of the Holy Cross. And some of the things that I'm hoping for in the next four years with the new upcoming administration are definitely a change in the polarization of this country. I hope that this nation is going to be able to finally uni uni unify. Um, you know, and I, I really hope that people are going to be able to have conversations with one another. I think the dialogue between people is missing. Um, we've all kind of gone into our own communities and a lot of groups have radicalized because of this so I really hope that you know there is going to be some sort of change in, in the nation's polarization. Additionally I hope that you know the Black Lives Matter protest um, will be acknowledged and 
I hope that you know Joe Biden enacts some policies that will actually create equality and justice in this country. We'll see. So within the next four years, what I am looking forward to seeing from this new administration personally is better opportunity for everyone in the education sector. And what I mean by that, I'm talking about people who are struggling with immigration status, people of color, um, people with disabilities, and people who are coming from low-income families. I want to see that everyone get the opportunity to go to college and get their degrees and finish on time. It's a privilege that I have today to be within my third year at Worcester State University, and I want everyone to experience that. You know, college may not be for everyone, but I want to see that, you know, the education sector is open for everyone. I want to see plans manifested to help people with disability. It shouldn't matter where you're from, how you look. Everybody deserves to have an education. And I want to see people who, who are coming from families like first generation students to get their degrees and break that cycle. You know, I know it's not easy, but that's what I'm looking forward to seeing in the next four years and beyond. Hi, my name is Ryan Candy, and I'm a senior at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Over the next four years, I'm hoping that our country can come together to tackle many of the immense challenges that we're facing today. From climate change, to systemic racism, to fighting disinformation, and to tackling this pandemic and fixing our healthcare system. We have a lot of work to do, but I'm optimistic for the future. With the inauguration of President Biden and the start of the 117th Congress, I hope our nation can come together, both in Washington, D.C. and across the country, to work together, to unite, to help one another, and work to create a promising future for all of us. I hope that we can address these challenges as a country with civil discourse and compromise. And I believe that together, with the leadership of President Biden, we can make a positive impact on our society. My name is Katherine Wagner, and I'm a junior at Worcester State University. Under the Biden-Harris administration, I'm hopeful for a more unified country, one where people from all different walks of life and of all different demographics can be treated with respect and equity. I'm also hopeful that this administration will be able to bring some much needed healing to this country after four long years of division. What I'm hopeful will happen during President Biden's administration is an improvement and investment in access, affordability, inclusion, and accountability. As a community college student, I understand the importance of technology and infrastructure, and the new administration brings us hope that it will be providing help towards the improvement of our facilities and technology. I hope the main priority would be on supporting students and our colleges as we continue to face and navigate this pandemic. As a student, I am extremely excited about the potential free tuition covered by the federal government, and I'm enthusiastic and hopeful for it to happen. I hope the administration understands our college's need for financial support and evidence-based practices to retain students to ensure they complete their degree requirements and graduate. I hope for acknowledgement about the importance of diversity and the importance of diverse communities, so I'm hopeful that the administration creates policies that bring international students back to campus. Since a number of colleges have been on the verge of closing permanently or facing financial difficulties due to the pandemic, international students would not only provide unique and different perspectives academically, but could help many struggling schools by bringing income increased tuition revenues. A college represents more than just students, and we will need to invest in other areas such as campus safety, updating our technology using classrooms for telecommunication, remote and hybrid learning, and stabilizing teacher employment. President-elect Biden has been transparent about his plans toward helping community colleges, and that gives me great belief and confidence that this new administration will provide the educational opportunities to help those in need, foster workforce development, drive economic growth, and strengthen our communities. I think what I look forward to about this coming administration is their efforts to get America's place on the world stage back. America was once looked up to as a, a, the epitome of freedom and democracy, and now we're laughed at by our allies and dictators alike for uh, the terrible legacy 
that our president has left on the Oval Office and on America's reputation on the world stage. And I think this coming administration is really wants to prioritize trying to bring back an appearance of decency and what Donald Trump didn't have when he was in office, trying to keep a normal attitude, trying to work with allies rather than alienate them over petty conflicts and work against dictators that wish to undermine democracy across the globe, including those who wish to undermine democracy here, and really trying to bring back that idea of an American identity, a unified America, rather than a divided nation that is squabbling amongst itself and making a fool of itself on the, the world stage and at home as well. And I think I'm hopeful that America will not be looked down upon anymore should we uh, get a better, uh, more decent president in office and we bring back that American spirit and show what's good about America rather than its worst flaws. As we get ready for the upcoming inauguration, there are four topics of discussion that I'm hopeful will be front and center on President-elect Biden's agenda. They include diversity, inclusion, family orientation, and a cure for this deadly virus. These four topics of are unavoidable. A lot needs to be done in the United States of America, and I'm fully aware some of these issues have been occurring decades after decades. Numerous people have made promises to, our, to fix our broken systems. With that being said, I'm hopeful that actions will take, be taken and change will be made because actions speak louder than words. Americans are well aware that talking about issues is a great way to seek change, but we need to do more and our country needs to do better. Right now we are divided and I have high hope someday soon we will join together. I am hopeful that we will rise together and overcome obstacles that are so challenging. I am optimistic that the inauguration will bring leaders who represent positivity and include role models who will help unite our entire country so that other countries will soon look up to the United States again. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jorga Gushi and I am an electrical and computer engineering student at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. As we know, the eyes of the country are upon President-elect Joe Biden, and so are mine as a citizen of the United States. One of my biggest hopes for the Biden-Harris administration is for schools to reopen safely as soon as possible. The president's education agenda must start by confronting the threat of the coronavirus as the nation is expected to face great learning loss and negative social and emotional impacts, especially for students of underrepresented populations. I'm hoping for an administration that will choose science over fiction, hoping for the US to rely on the advice of scientists and public health experts to combat the global pandemic, to restore the reputations of the Centers for Disease and Control and for the Food and Drug Administration, and to reverse restrictions that have made the United States a less attractive place for students and researchers for other countries. I also anticipate policies targeting the economic inequality and supporting economic growth, both of which impact health outcomes. I hope this administration will tackle student debt and develop policies to lessen the burden of student loans, perhaps even forgiving at least some portion of those federal student loans. Overall, I can imagine a Biden-Harris administration promoting a more equity-oriented approach to lead the United States of America. Hi, my name is Maggie Connolly and I'm a senior at the College of the Holy Cross. This administration is really important to me as it is to many people in this country because it was my first presidential election, but it was also the first presidential election that I got really involved with on the ground through activism and organizing. I think we saw a huge uptick in grassroots organizing and youth-led organizing for this election cycle, and I hope that that trend does not slow down and doesn't change. I think that that we saw really kind of change the outcome of the election and helped us get the results that we needed as a country. And so I really do hope that that continues over the course of the next four years, whether it's lobbying for policy change that we need in this country, like 
climate justice, racial justice, or immediately COVID-19 relief, just to name a couple things that I hope that we work for under this administration. But I also hope that that trend continues after these four years and into the rest of this country and every election cycle to come. I think it's hugely important for democracy to see organizers on the ground making their voices heard through elections and through campaigns. And so I am really hopeful for the next four years. I think there's a lot to be grateful for, but a lot of work still to do. So cheers to Biden and Harris and cheers to the next four years. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eric Miller. I am a junior at Worcester State University studying history and political science. During the 2020 campaign, I was a staunch supporter of the Biden-Harris ticket. And needless to say, I was overjoyed at the results of the election. As a voter in Massachusetts, I always decide between candidates based off of their commitments to two major policy issues. The first is environmentalism and the second is gun violence prevention. And for these reasons, supporting Joe Biden in the election was an easy decision. With a Democratic majority in both houses of Congress, I am confident that President Biden will make progress on both of these fronts over the next four years. As a proponent of the Green New Deal, I trust that the Biden-Harris administration will prioritize the battle against climate change, rejoining the Paris Climate Accords on the first day of his presidency, investing $2 trillion in the renewable energy reducing America's carbon footprint and laying the frame for a green economy. And as somebody who ardently supports comprehensive gun control measures, I firmly believe that our 46th president will pursue the reform this country desperately needs in the White House, strengthening background checks, closing purchasing loopholes, fighting the NRA, and enacting the same common sense regulations that President-elect Biden spearheaded as a U.S. Senator in 1994. Our country suffers from a gun violence epidemic unlike any other developed nation on Earth. And I know Biden will tackle this issue head on in the Oval Office. I also believe Biden will act swiftly to enshrine federal protections for LGBTQ Americans, expand organizational power for labor unions, improve funding for public education, raise the federal minimum wage for the first time since 2009, enact COVID-19 relief, for working Americans, rejoin the Iranian nuclear deal, and humanize our immigration system. I believe that we are turning the page from a dark period in American history and ushering in a new chapter for our country, and that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will help lead us there starting today, January 20th, 2021. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the HECMA pre-inauguration event today. Now check the chat below for links to watch the inauguration of our 46th President Joe Biden live on TV or streaming.